since the introductory um, aisle, the introductory, um, the walk through Jewish history as it relates to our life cycle and our holidays, and we thought this was a wonderful way to introduce the sale and also the catalog if any of you have had an opportunity to look at it. So just a little introduction to um, Jewish life cycle and Jewish holidays with representative examples from the sale um, from major points, whether it's birth, circumcision, marriage, bar mitzvah, and so forth, and, and the major holidays. But the route through the exhibition starts chronologically, going as far back as antiquity. A major Renaissance um, object is, of course, the great mission of Torah, which is in the front of the But then we'll go chronologically through the, through the galleries. But from the medieval times is this extraordinary aquamanile, which is um, probably dating from about the 12th century with a somewhat later Jewish inscription. And we believe that there are only four aquamaniles in the world which have um, Hebrew inscriptions. And we may even say something about textiles. And it's made by an artist um, who belongs to a family of artists that obviously had, while Christian, because you, Jewish artists were not allowed to be members of the guilds, um, so this is a, this, these are Christian families, but they obviously have close ties with the Jewish community and are, are being patronized by them for Jewish ritual objects, even though you know, they would not have necessarily know the, the ceremonies and the cultures in which these objects were used. But you have to think, when you, when you look at an object that's being made by a, a Christian artist or a Jew, you have to think that there, there was some level of explanation there required as well, whether they were giving prototypes or explaining what they wanted. But you've got a very close, uh, very late Renaissance Baroque interaction of patron and artist going on. And when, it's, when it works wonderfully well, you get creations like this, which looks much better with light on. Um, <laughs> and you come close. Like yeah. 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 Please come, come, come close, because it's the sort of thing that really, be, you know, it, it benefits from really close examination. I mean, you know, look, starting from the top, you've got this wonderful ratchet with the, with the big double eagle. I mean, Frankfurt's one of these towns where, you know, yes, they are confined, con you know, they have to be in the ghetto. The Frankfurt ghetto was actually probably the most densely populated place in Europe in the early 18th century, but they are allowed to live there. They're not being chased out. And in recognition of these um, really privileges, although they don't seem like that to us today, the privileges that they were allowed, you, you get these Jews adopting the double-headed eagle. They like the fact that they're under the, the patronage of the Holy Roman Empire. It spells protection for them. And so you get the double-headed eagle on pieces like this. If you look, you've got figures holding emblems of all the holidays going around. You've got the matzah and the matzah pricker. Um, you've got the shofar for Yom Kippur. You've got Havdalah. You've got um, Sukkot. Um, just go around and it's, you know, you really have all the holidays represented here with, with these wonderful, very vigorous, almost dancing figures, each holding the attributes. Um, just like when, when you've got the point where you're going from uh, gas to electric in the early 20th century, here at the turn of the 18th century, you've got both candlelight and oil. So you, know, you could light all of it, maybe you could use this most of the time and only these um, for the Sabbath, but you know, you, you've got both options. Um, I wanted to talk briefly about what is surely one of the highlights of this sale, and one of the highlights of Hebrew manuscripts, uh, illuminated Hebrew manuscripts of all time. What you're looking at over here, is an open uh, page uh, of the Mishnah Torah. The Mishnah Torah is Maimonides' uh, magnum opus. Uh, it is a monumental code of Jewish law. It is the first organized code of Jewish law after the Talmud. The post-Talmudic, uh, the Talmud, of course, had everything included in it, but it had it in all different places. And uh, he decides to create a standard code of Jewish law. Maimonides was, was the greatest legal thinker, philosopher, author of the medieval period. You're looking at one of only four known uh, manuscripts. Uh, that had any kind of decoration for the Mishnah Torah, but this supersedes them all because the other three manuscripts don't have text-related illustrations. 
Whereas uh, this manuscript, is which was created in Italy around the year 1457, is a masterpiece of Renaissance art and the way in which it incorporates the artistic traditions into this manuscript is quite, quite interesting. And what we have is a collaboration between a scribe, uh, whose name is Nehemiah, and a Christian artist who has been uh, identified as the master of the Barbo Missal. This was conceived of as a two-volume set. Um, the first volume actually found its way to the Vatican, and that includes books one through five. And this volume uh, includes books seven through 14 of the Mishnah Torah. Book six is, is lost. We don't know where it is. It presumably is lost from the Vatican volume. This has six uh, magnificent full-page uh, illustrations for uh, six of the openings, and you can see them around you. The uh, opening over here to Sefer Nezikin, which is the Book of Damages, and you see uh, two men engaged in what could be some very damaging activity. They've got very sharp stilettos in their uh, hands. Uh, besides pulling each other's hair, there are going to be some, some, some complications. Some damage. Some damage. <laughs> yeah. some damage. We see a robber uh, uh, pulling clothing out of a window, and up on top is the proverbial shor hapor, the ox that gores. Uh, and all of the sort of laws surrounding these damages are found in this particular book. This is the book of Shoftim, uh, which is actually over here. And uh, you uh, see a man being brought in front of a court. Um, over here we see uh, the book of Purity, Sefer um, <coughs> Tahara, uh, with uh, a man lying in a tent, and of course, uh, according to Jewish law, the sort of chief source of impurity of Tuma is uh, death, and um, and uh, and whoever enters into a tent where there is uh, a corpse uh, also will become Tamei, and so these people are sort of thinking about uh, maybe not entering into that tent. And finally, Sefer Karbanot. Uh, here you see the law of uh, sacrifices. This is actually Karban Pesach it begins with, um, and they're sort of roasting the sacrificial lamb for Pesach and for Passover, and then uh, consuming the uh, Passover meal. And according to um, sort of the, the book of Exodus, the meal was supposed to be consumed at the ready, at the first meal, certainly. So they were supposed to stand there with their shoes on and their staffs in their hand, and that's why you see them uh, sort of ready to run. They're ready to exit, uh, uh, to, to leave Egypt. And you know, you know, normally we don't bring our staffs to the meal uh, when we're ready to sit down and the usual meal, but this might be harkening back to um, earlier times, sort of thinking about the actual Passover in Egypt.